So thanks everyone for coming to the Something Completely Different Emerging Artist Talk. We're at the Craig Gallery today. I wanted to uh, introduce myself. I'm Carrie McKay. I'm the Programming Coordinator for Visual Arts Nova Scotia. And I get to work with this fabulous group of emerging artists and their mentors throughout the year. They've been working really hard in this exhibition is just sort of a end of program celebration. The real work that they've been doing is all year long with their mentors to work on their, um, on their practice. Uh, so this exhibition and the mentorship program is funded by the Craig Foundation who are super generous to us. The Craig Gallery here saves us a slot every year and we're very appreciative. Also, um, the city of Halifax, the Department of Communities, Culture and Heritage in Nova Scotia and the Canada Council for the Arts. Um, so we thank them all for their support. Uh, in this program and in this exhibition, we have emerging artist Trevor Novak and he's being mentored by Robin Metcalf. Uh, we have Sarah Mosier and she's being mentored by Melissa Marr. We have Celine Gabrielle, and she's being mentored by Susan Took. And we have Liam Ross, and he's being mentored by David Davini. So uh, when the time comes, I'm gonna invite everyone to unmute and ask questions, but I thought I would start us off with a question first. I would love to hear from the emerging artists about uh, their work in this exhibition. Um, so Trevor, if you wanted to get us started, you wanted to tell us a little bit about your work in the show. Yeah, um, thanks, Carrie. Um, I'm just going to share a little bit about my practice and a little bit about my process and uh, also some thoughts that I had about my work this morning. Um, so I was just going to share a little slideshow as I talk. Um, so just hang on one second as I get that going. Uh, whoops. Okay. Is that working? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, over the past year and a bit. Uh, my work has been focused on responding to sculptures which project a certain type of mythology onto our present lives. They are art pieces that tell us very specific stories, very telling story or very tailored stories about our past. And they're stories that are often taken as unchangeable fact. I believe, or I'd like to think that our past is or should be an ever-changing experience, just like our present and future should also be. Um, there have been a lot of calls to tear down and destroy many of these sculptures and many responses that this would be sort of an erasure of history. And while I'm not sure that you can erase history, um, you can tell new stories and create new experiences that counter what we've been led to believe, which is basically what I've been trying to um, do with my work uh, recently. Um, the work that I have exhibited at the Craig right now came out of a series of busts which I made, uh, which are based off of Renaissance busts of notice, notable men of power. Um, at the time, my interest was mainly in the fabulous hair that these men had. They just had the most luscious, beautiful flowing locks uh, that they clearly took a lot of pride in. And I was very much into that. Um, and when the pandemic began um, and going to the studio became a little more difficult, I bought some, brought some pieces home and began scribbling on them with pencil crayon. And soon after that, um, protesters began graffitiing and drawing on sculptures of Confederate generals. And my work took on a bit of a different context, not so much about fabulous hair anymore. Um, from the start, I wanted to portray these men as completely silly, the completely silly pompous fools that they were, only existing in our collective memory because they had the money and power to do so. And many of these men were born into money, yet they portray themselves as masters of their existence. Um, 
And I'm especially interested in the dynamic of uh, this image of the horse and the rider or um, equestrian monuments, uh, because it, I think it's all about that perceived control, um, this idea of uh, control over their animal, um, which I think can kind of be seen as a metaphor for control of the natural world and their surroundings. Um, if they're able to control the thing between their legs, they can do anything, or that's what I think these images are kind of telling us. Uh, and the reality of the situation is that the, a lot of these men were born into money and power and had no control over anything in the way that they thought they did. They kind of flailed about mindlessly and oblivious to their surroundings uh, with no idea of the impact that they were having. Um, which doesn't mean that they didn't have power and that they certainly did. Um, I guess it means that if they just stopped playing with the thing between their legs for a little bit, they might have seen the damage they were causing and continuing to cause. Um, I do take a lot of joy in poking fun at these men, um, but the truth is that they do still have a lot of power over us. Um, and I would like to think that by portray, uh, portraying them in a different light and telling new ever evolving stories that we can hopefully take some of that power away or at least see our past in a bit of a different light. Um, I think our past has a profound impact on us, uh, but that doesn't mean we can't change that through the stories that we tell. Um, and as you've seen through the slides that I've been showing, I do trace most of my finished digital drawings. Uh, that's partially because I can't draw and is also because these images are kind of ridiculous in their own way. And it takes only a little bit of embellishment to change that narrative. Even putting a slight grin on a horse's face makes a bit difference. I mean, maybe that grin was already there, um, but I'm not quite sure. Um, actually, for this image, I had finished the drawing and thought that that was the goofiest looking horse I'd ever seen until I went back to the source image and just realized that, in fact, this was the goofiest horse that I'd ever seen. Uh, there's no getting around it. Um, I should also probably talk a little about pizza because it's kind of taken over my art recently. Um, first off, I guess I'll talk a little bit about my process, which kind of goes back and forth between drawing sketches and finished drawings and sculptures and kind of back and forth again between those where each iteration kind of borrows from the other. And as I create the sculptures, I usually increase the scale as well, which leaves kind of room for new interpretations from myself as I work. I often like work very spontaneously. So things kind of like, I do have the source drawings, but I um, will often take a lot of chances and kind of play around with composition as I'm working. Um, the pizza was just like an easily recognizable object that I could make at a very small scale and you could still tell what it was. And from that, it kind of became something else. And right now I kind of see it as a symbol for greed or gluttony. And in the world that these men live in, it's literally falling into their laps as they go along their merry way. Um, and that is pretty much all I wanted to say. And I have more slides that I'll just skip through. And thanks so right. much, Trevor. Thank you. Um, Sarah, do you want to tell us a little bit about what your work is in this exhibition? Yeah, thanks, Trevor. That was great, um, enlightening to what you've been working on. Um, my work is mostly based on uh, question and uh, uh, that I have myself in the last few years is how 
Um, I could make my work more accessible to people who are visually impaired. Um, and I want to start by thanking all the visually impaired friends and acquaintances who have been my teachers and companions over the last few years. And I've learned so much, but I also have so much more to learn. Um, so basically how I got into this question is a little bit of a backstory. So um, as a child, I had a disease called optic neuritis, which I still have but uh, I had a flare up when I was a child and uh, I was legally blind for a period of time. Um, eh. One thing is that I have always been legally blind in one eye, but when this happened, I couldn't see well at all. And uh, so it got better. It's just the nature of the disease that it it got better and uh, I'm perfectly fine. And I've not had a problem since the age of 11. So that's great. But as a person who has decided to, who as a career to become an artist, um, how can I evolve my art practice to be accessible for myself if I ever did have a vision problem again? And what kind of career choice is it as a visual artist with a person with an issue to be a visual artist as a person with a history of visual impairment and possibility of it happening again? And better yet, how can I make work now that is accessible for people who are visually impaired and blind in a in an art form that is considered purely visual? Um, so this journey kind of started in about 2017. I started volunteering for the CNIB, um, which matched me with a lady as her vision mate. So I just help her with everyday chores around the house and anything she needs to talk about or needs help with. Um, I just help her with for a couple hours a week. So, but in through talking to her, it's really, enlightened me to like the inaccessibility of our world for those with vision problems. Um, in 2018, I got an opportunity to do an artist residency in New Glasgow, Nova Scotia. And when I got that opportunity, I proposed to develop my work to be more accessible. And I did that knowing absolutely nothing about how I would do that, but just posing that question and uh, learning from the ground up. And in my time there, I was fortunate enough to meet a lady named Julie, who I met in New Glasgow. She um, is a bit of an activist in the area or an advocate for the uh, visually impaired and disabled community and um, through her connections and her knowledge we created an art group for people with vision loss. I used the group as an opportunity for a bit of an experiment into accessible art making and um, the biggest project that we did together was a quilt as I usually work in textiles. I can try to share my screen to show a photo of that. I think. I've never done this before. Can you see my screen? Okay. Okay. Uh, let me go full screen on that. So this is at the end of our um, 
mentorship or at the end of our uh, or at the end of my residency when uh, we uh, showed it was a mostly finished quilt that we'd done together as a community. So after that, uh, I wanted to continue it, but I was having str a struggle with finding studio space and uh, getting some guidance into where to go next. Um, so when the mentorship opportunity came up for 2020 to 2021, I was happy to explore this further. And I got matched with Melissa who uh, co-founded Wonderneath. So that's a community arts organization. So it was a good match for me, seeing as I done some community arts um, by the seat of my pants in the past. Um, so, uh, and as everybody knows, the last couple of years I've had, uh, uh, it's been a struggle to uh, work in the studio. And in January of this year, as we kind of were trying to figure out what I was going to do for this exhibition, um, I went out to Pictou County to interview folks who had attended my art group. And some of them are in the image here. Um, I took photos and recorded our conversations. Um, I have a history of working in film photography. And so that's what I did. I wanted to ask them how the, the pandemic affected their lives and uh, their answers were varied, but as I suspected, they were, um, there was a stress on that they were struggling um, navigating public places that they were used to going to, but had changed very quickly. Um, grocery stores, especially, are not very accommodating to people with visual impairments. And uh, like, as in the arrows on the ground are not um, tactile in any form. So if you can't see it, you can't do what it says. And uh, they got rid of baskets, which are preferred for using a white cane. Those are just two examples. Um, some folks were especially afraid to go out just because they have other health issues on top of vision loss issues. And so they've been extremely cautious in going out. Others said they did not experience much difference at all, but I think this may have to do with living rurally and having more remaining vision and relying on others um, to do some of those tougher jobs. And there were some silver linings to the pandemic. For example, one individual had stuck had been stuck in another province with her grandchildren for several months and the time they ended up spending together was really special. So after all uh, the hard work I put into these photos and interviews, which were done socially distanced and safely, I got back from my trip and I found out most of my film photos did not turn out at all and it was devastating. Um, I was unsure about what to do next. Um, but I, what I ended up doing was taking the uh, stories and observations and making drawings from them. Um, I'd been doing drawings on small pieces of paper with a thick black marker to, because it would help keep my drawings very, very simple and graphic. And I scanned the images and started screen printing them with Mel Melissa's help because uh, she has access to the studio at Wonderneath. So um, yeah, so I ended up doing work on plywood as you can see behind me. And there'll be a little video after the fact to show better. Um, but yeah. Uh, my goal here was to make the work accessible for those who are uh, who have low vision, but also um, can be seen 
by someone who has no vision at all as well. So um, yeah, uh, so some of these pieces refer to experiences and feelings that people have had during the pandemic. Um, I wanted to do several more, but because of restrictions during our time, I had um, an issue. Um, I had an issue getting into the studio because of the lockdown that we had more recently. So um, I had to adjust again and some of the work I had to do with the ink was actually done painting individually four pieces instead of screen printing, which would be much faster. But um, yeah, so we're all learning to adapt and do things differently in the studio. Um, I ended up getting a studio in my brother's place in the attic. So it feels really great to have a place to uh, actually work out of that I don't live in as well. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so it's just like just a start kind of like in progress is what I'm considering it to be. Um, the uh, large braille piece here is, uh, it says uh, curse of the visually impaired darling. So um, that refers to a quote from one of my friends out there and a person who is an advocate for visually impaired. That's what she says COVID stands for is curse of the visually impaired, darling. So yeah, I thought that was great. Yeah. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, Celine, would you feel like talking a little bit next to us? Sure. So, hello, my name is Celine Gabrielle. So, my work here is behind me. All right, so my story um, and the work of the show. I had wanted to be an artist my whole life. Um, and as a child, I was creative and I went to an arts high school. But then I grew up in Ottawa. Um, when I was in high school, I started to really buy into the um, starving artist type of mindset. And even though I did look into going to a secondary uh, to pursue art, I just chickened out and I didn't. So I pursued other things and I had a career um, for over 20 years in a different field. And then I became a mom and then I moved to Nova Scotia. And so life just got in the way. I sort of thought I'd do other things and still create on the side, but I just never did. Until um, what actually happened was I was diagnosed with a risk condition and the type of work I was doing was very hands-on. And so I just couldn't do that work anymore. And so I had to reevaluate and figure out like what was the next move for me. And so I did try some other things um, and none of them were really, they weren't the right fit. And I just kept always dreaming and talking about art. And so after one of probably many conversations with my husband, he's like, just, just start making stuff again. Just, you have the time right now, um, figuring out what, what your next move is. And my kids were in school at that point. So I had a little bit more, um, flexibility. And so Finally, I just said, okay, so I just scrambled around the house and found like some old watercolors and some paper and some stuff that I had on hand. And even though I hadn't created anything really, um, I was creative in my life. I had a small business, so I did marketing and I love fashion. So that was a creative outlet for me and um, doing creative things with my kids, but I never created myself. Um, but I had been thinking and thinking and thinking about if I was going to create, what would I create? What would it look like? So I had a lot of ideas that I just never followed through on. So this was 2018. So yeah, that first night I just made something, um, a watercolor sketch. And then from there I thought, okay, I'm really going to give this um, a good try. And so I dedicated like that next year, 2018, 2019, approximately to creating and learning. Um, Back in my younger days, I 
uh, really liked painting, but I had only ever tried watercolors uh, and acrylics. And it would, I would cite the medium. I, I like both of those for certain things, but the envision I had in my mind, I just couldn't create um, with them. And so one of the things I did in the early stage was go to um, beginner oil painting class at NASPAD, which is one of the schools I had always wanted to go to. So to go to a night class was really exciting. So anyway, I did that and that was life changing. That really flipped the switch for me because I could finally create the things I had envisioned in my mind um, through learning how to paint with oil. So that was sort of the beginning 2018, 2019. Late 2019, I finally had started. So I dabbled a lot early on. Um, I, I'm very active on Instagram and that was a good source for me. So I live actually in Wolfville in a little, it's a tiny town, for those of you who don't know. And um, I didn't have any artist friends. I don't, I don't have an art community. So I, I went online to try to find that. Anyway, so I started doing like these Instagram challenges to try to create, just create every day, create, create, create. So that first time I did doing that. And then I started to think, okay, well, now that I'm creating all this work, I'd love to share it with the world. So how can I do that? So I started looking for open calls. So I found one um, at Argyle Fine Art here in Halifax, and I submitted a painting, and I had never done anything like that before, and it, um, it was accepted. So that was like a huge milestone for me, because up until that point, it was just like friends and family saying, oh, we like your work. But to have somebody who sees a lot of art I uh, look at it and say, yes, we will accept this for a gallery was, was a big milestone for me. Um, and then that painting sold at that show. And so then I thought also, oh, okay, other people actually really like my work. And that sort of was a catalyst to push me forward. So moving forward, um, I started creating, so my work typically right now is looking a lot like what you see behind me. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. So you can see there are people and there's clothes. Those are my two big interests. So I've always been really interested in fashion. And part of the main reason I'm so interested in fashion is because I think we human beings use it as a way um, to show the world who we want to be or who we are, who we are or who we want to be. Um, oftentimes you look at somebody and you have an idea right away of the type of person that would wear that that outfit and I just find that really fascinating. And so my work is definitely tied to identity and how we show up in the world. And then I'm also just really interested in fashion and the fashion industry. And actually right now, um, thanks to my kids a couple of years ago, they really got me more interested in like the whole climate change. And so the fashion industry is are really, really, really bad for the environment. And so I'm also interested in um, those types of, the ways that now like my daughter's generation, she's a teenager, is very interested in thrifting. And, um, but then there's also the fast fashion side. So I'm sort of also interested in my paintings in blending the lines a little bit between like haute couture fashion and like thrift fashion. and what is style and how it all comes together. So for example, this, um, this painting over here, uh, the green blouse. So I'm gonna do like everybody and try to share my screen because this one has kind of an interesting story. I, I'm like you, Sarah, I don't know how to share my screen. Do I do that? Do I press? Maybe I'm on an iPad. Maybe it's not going to let me do that. Uh, no. Okay. It doesn't matter. I'll just tell you what happened. So sometimes, especially early on, I was... Um, inspired by found images, magazine images. But 
what I've started to do um, is move away from that so much and actually look for real people, real fashion, and or I've been like styling looks um, with thrifted fashion and trying to make it well back to blurring the lines between like okay show my fashion and like thrift store, but maybe you can't tell the difference. So this painting over here, the green blouse. So this was during COVID. Um, another friend of mine who's an artist on Instagram took to sharing nighttime stories. That was her like very, very early on, you know, when everybody was excited and sharing stuff and trying to entertain one another. So she would dress up and share um, these bedtime stories. And so one day I was tuning in and this was the blouse she was wearing and I was just blown away by, by it. It was just gorgeous and again back to the time that we were in it was reflecting how even though she was home and even though it was a scary daunting time a she was trying to bring some joy to people and b she was dressing up to do it like she wasn't just showing up in her sweats like probably i was in she took the time to put herself together like this so um what she did i messaged her and just said oh my god you look beautiful i love this blouse would you send me a bunch of photos so she sent me like 50 photos and i ended up um, blending too because you can see right there there's a big bow and um, I really love the way the bow looks in one photo and then she's familiar with my work and so she did all this fun posing for me and I just thought um, the way she positioned her hands made a really interesting composition and so that's how that painting came to be. One more thing I'll just touch on real quick before I'll pass it over to Liam is that you'll notice that I crop um, my images and my people. And I did that for a couple of reasons. So the main reason, well, I don't know, maybe they're equal, but one of the reasons is I really like to play with the composition. So by cropping the image, um, yeah, you're just getting a sense of it without maybe the whole thing. So your mind is sort of filling in the rest, which I like. And the other reason I crop them is because they're portraits without being an actual portrait. Like, as I've been creating works, what a lot of people will say to me is like, oh my God, it looks like me, or it looks like my friend, or it looks like my sister, or I could see myself in that painting. And so it's a way of making the painting accessible and relatable to people who might not know the person, they can still see part of themselves in the painting. So yeah, that's all I'll say about that for now. And um, thanks for watching. Thanks so much, Celine. That's great. Um, I will pass it over now to um, Liam Ross, who is going to chat about his work. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Liam Ross. I am a emerging artist and curator in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Um, my work I work in a very interdisciplinary way. Um, my work often has to do with things that we hold as dichotomies in nature, in society, um, things like good and evil, um, chaos and order, uh, na natural and unnatural, and trying to find the strange or discomforting um, gray spots in the middle where things are ambiguous and we don't like to talk about them. <laughs> um, the work that I created for this exhibit was, there we go. Uh, the work I created for this exhibit is a bit different than my usual body of work. I usually work with a lot of color. I work very graphically. I work with a sort of um, unconventional sense of humor. Uh, but for this work, uh, this year, working with David Davini, I was re I really felt encouraged to, to feel empowered and say like you, like, you can work with whatever you want and it's gonna be you, it's gonna be your work. And so I just, I gave myself the challenge of what, how far can I push it? How far can I push my work away? from what I feel like is recognizably my own and just see, see what it does. Um, 
and this sort of there's that quote of, you know, wherever you go, there you are. And so doing this work and seeing what I was interested in was really, really interesting and helped me learn a lot about myself. Uh, the work that I'm exhibiting here at the Craig Gallery has a lot to do with the research I've been doing about ufology um, and the history of alien encounters and alien abductions. Um, they're very interesting, scary, strange, alluring stories in a way. And I think what really drew me to them was this idea of uh, the idea of the fear of the unknown and the fear of structures beyond our comprehension. Um, there's, so there's two bodies of work that, there's, there's, uh, there's pieces from two bodies of work that I'm exhibiting here at the Craig Gallery, plus a third standalone piece. Uh, this piece is from a series called Anthracite, where I was really interested in the ideas of like structure and non-literal languages, uh, representational languages, imaginary languages from like fictional stories. And you hear in these alien encounter stories, like often like they're, they see strange sigils or glyphs on the side of spaceships or inside the spaceships, uh, or the aliens speak in strange languages. And so I was interested in sort of creating these very, abstract compositions that said something about structure and order, but in a unknowable way. Uh, the title anthracite refers to, uh, refers to a allotype of carbon. Carbon is a very interesting element because uh, it has so many allotypes. Uh, if you were to put them on a rough scale from uh, least pure to most pure. At the least pure end of the scale, we have things like coal, which is something that we relate to the past. It's a non-renewable energy. It's terrible for the environment. It's impure. It's brown. Uh, it's like brownish black. It's like peat. It's, uh, we burn it. We burn it for fire in this very em elemental way. And then at the far end of the scale of allotypes, we have things like diamond and graphite, um, and we have anthracite. Um, anthracite and uh, anthracite and graphite, and graphite is sort of the element of the future because it's we talk about like graphite, graphite nanotubes, uh, carbon nanotubes, which are these incredible elemental technologies that can help us better harness the power that we generate, and it, it's so is this interesting thing of like carbon as this substance that is both the past and the future. And right in the middle is anthracite, which is sort of neither coal nor is it pure graphite. Um, and so these anthracite works sort of said something about the past and the future, unknowing things that can feel informative or can feel confusing. Um, and this was like based on based on my research into uh, alien encounters. Um, this piece is called Relativity, the Sun and the Moon. Uh, this was, I mean, as you probably tell, this is like, the anthracite pieces are so structured and they're so uh, inorganic and relativity really was about pushing myself into that other extreme of how can I create something that's really round and momentary and can't really be replicated. Um, I really, I did just, I don't really have much to say about this work other than I really, really love it. <laughs> um, I think it's a really beautiful piece. I'm really proud of it. Um, and I guess in the creation process, I was, there's this, there's this like sort of fun fact about our solar system that the sun is 400 times further away from the earth than the moon, but it's also 400 times larger. And so for absolutely no rational reason, the sun, from the perspective of humans on earth, the sun and the moon are nearly the same size in the sky, completely against all odds of anything ever in the universe. And that 
completely random fact has been the basis of cosmogony through human history. Like it's the, the earliest religions were like sun worship and moon worship. Um, and that's something that still is relevant today. And so it's this, this idea of the relationship between the sun and the moon. And it's like, it's something that even allows for solar eclipses, um, which are these incredible celestial phenomenons. And here's a close up shot. And this, this was, all these works were made with um, India ink, which has a really beautiful surface quality and a working quality. Uh, anthracite was made with acrylic ink for the reds and this was made with print ink for the gold. Um, the second series of works that I was showing in this exhibit are a series called Human Beings. And this was informed by stories about abduction, but it was also, I mean, unavoidably, we were talking about, you're thinking about the pandemic, you're thinking about um, the, the human rights, de the human rights um, demonstrations last summer that are continuing, that have continued and will continue. Um, this idea of crowds of people and the connectedness between us all and whether that whether that's like a, a, a fun, nice connection in a spiritual sense or more of a damning connection of like, we're all sort of stuck on this planet together in close quarters. Um, in this piece, Human Beings Number 7, there's sort of a more, uh, there's a more obvious relationship to this idea of humans in a crowd beneath these three taller uh, divine figures, neither, neither and both divine or alien and beneath this inverted triangle, inverted equilateral triangle, which to me represents a kind of celestial authority. Um, this piece, uh, Human Beings number six. Um, this is a larger piece, a large piece of paper, and it became very compelling to me to sort of, to take these white sheets of paper and, and to populate them repetitively with silhouettes of humans and to sort of figure out how the crowd figured itself out. And in this piece, um, it's, it's kind of difficult to tell with these photos, but amongst this crowd of black India ink figures, there are several randomly placed red figures in red acrylic ink. And making this and presenting this really, it became about the idea of not a specific otherness, but a general otherness of sort of, you get into like fantastical otherness of like these red figures amongst the black figures are hybrid human, human like hu hybrid human aliens, like aliens in disguise, like amongst us. And then on the other end, it's like, um, just sort of a general sense of otherness or being held apart, like this fear that everyone has whenever you go out in public, like, like am I infected? Do I have it? Like the capital I, it, like whatever the it is that you bring, like whatever your anxieties are about being othered in public. Um, I can't speak to all of the possibilities, but like, I mean, I have mine that are personal, um, like the fear of, the fear of being infected, the fear of being strange, the fear of being othered in a way that is imp imperceptible to myself, but obvious to others. Um, and that's something that like, it used to be much more difficult to contend with, but I'm, I'm better at it now. Dressing like a loon helps a lot. <laughs> you just like you have to you have to just have to take control of it um but this piece the human beings series is very much about otherness and the fear of otherness and the fear of being othered i guess that's as much as i have to say i'll de i'll de share my screen Uh, thanks so much, Liam. Um, 
I also wanted to ask uh, people just a little bit about their time in the program, um, in the mentorship program, and maybe let us know a little bit about your experience or what have you, if you want to share just a little bit of your time here. Um, Liam, did you want to go first on that? Yeah, I can. Uh... I'm unmuted. Perfect. Um, this mentorship was so, so good. Like just anyone who's listening or watching this afterwards, like if you are, you should apply to this. This was a really good opportunity. Um, I got to work with David Devinney, which was a really, really incredible experience. Uh, David Devinney is a curator at the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia. Um, when I applied for this, I didn't, I applied as an artist. I didn't apply as an emerging curator. And so to get paired with David Davini was this sort of unexpected, uh, incredible thing that happened by chance. And so I got to work with David. I got to see behind the scenes at the AGNS. Um, I got to assist in putting together the AGNS's uh, newest semi-permanent exhibit, which is called Tyranny. It's so good, it's really exciting. Um, in my practice, doing this mentorship, David was like just incredibly supportive and really helped me find the confidence to feel like a professional and to say, like that I mentioned earlier, it's just like, like, hey, whatever you make, it's gonna be you. Um, and what you say matter, and like what you have to say is important, it matters, you deserve to have a voice. Um, in terms of specific things, like he helped me, he really helped me recognize my love of working with archives and archived information and like the idea of outdated information, which really interests me. Um, he just, yeah, he just supported me like every step of the way and being part of this group, like, just helped me feel like I was part of something. It was so. just, yeah, just really great. <laughs> That's great, thanks, Liam. Um, was there anyone else who, uh, any of the other emerging artists who wanted to talk a little bit about their time in the program? Um. Yeah, I guess just um, like off of what like Liam was saying about like uh, confidence, um, working with uh, Robin Metcalf was just like amazing. And like a big part of that was just having that person to talk to and to encourage you and to like bounce ideas off of um, was a, it was a really big help. Um, and also just like having someone to kind of like share your goals with and to have them kind of like be that person who's accountable um, was also like a major, major help and really helped me kind of like work towards um, some of the goals that I'd set out at the beginning um, of this program. Um, and I guess also just like it's, it was, I'm not like a very, very good at kind of like putting myself out there I'm like I often will like isolate myself in a lot of ways uh, so this pandemic has just been like very detrimental to me um so also like having um having that kind of person to be able to go to and kind of like share work with and just get like feedback was just invaluable to me Thanks, Trevor. Thanks so much. Um, Sarah or Celine, did you want to share anything as well? I, I unmuted. Is that okay? Okay. Um, yeah, so sort of building a little bit on what I was talking about earlier, my mentor was Susan Took, and we sort of talked a lot about, um, yeah, that concept of 
people and fashion and identity. And so one of the ideas that I'm going to build on that we talked about together was exploring like the local people in Nova Scotia. Um, and also she has a lot of experience with grants, which is something I didn't, and I would say still don't really know a lot about. So she encouraged me to apply for a creator grant. So that is, I haven't done it yet because I was really trying to hash out um, more specifically the idea, but what I really want to do is look at um, kind of like the secret lives of Nova Scotians, like being from Ontario and then coming here in my 20s, I definitely, although I had extended family here, so I was aware of Nova Scotia, but I didn't live here. I really thought like everybody here was either a fisherman or a farmer. And like, that was it. <laughs> I, didn't really, I didn't really know like the diversity and the interests of all the people here. And the longer I've lived here, um, it's like, you know, that's what I think probably, unfortunately, still a lot of the world thinks, but there's such um, interesting people doing all kinds of stuff. And um, yeah, so I just wanna try to tap into that a little bit more and develop a series of paintings based on the secret lives of Nova Scotians, sort of like, um, and what people wear doing the things that they're doing that is not necessarily, I mean, maybe there'll be a fisherman thrown in, who knows, that yellow outfit could be cool. But um, anyway, yeah, so that was one of the ideas that came about through chatting with Susan and uh, yeah, so that's something that was part of my experience. Uh, thanks so much, Celine. That's great to hear. I love these um, kind of behind the scenes stories from folks. Um, Sarah, did you wanna tell us a little bit about your time in the mentorship program? Sure, yeah. Yeah, so I was paired with Melissa Marr uh, co-founder of Wonderneath. So um, it was a really great experience um, in actually creating a really good networking opportunity for me personally, and also um, a little bit of a kick in the butt because of the pandemic, I got a little bit lazy. And, uh, you know, I think we all kind of felt that. Um, I was working a lot at my job and uh, kind of just going to work, going home, not really dealing with my art stuff. So definitely helped me focus more on what I really want to be doing instead of, you know, um, getting complacent. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, and the opportunities and the different materials and things that she introduced me to is like a great breadth of knowledge of um, different mediums and she just works with like everything out of that studio so um that was really great too um yeah i would highly recommend it for anybody who is just trying to get to their next step in uh, art making thanks so much sarah um i would love to for any of the folks um, who are watching, if you have any questions for the emerging artists in this program, feel free to just unmute and ask. Um, I have a question for Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Laura. Hi, um, so I met Sarah in the spring, Mar it was around March, 2019 when I had, I was doing my own show, participatory show in New Glasgow and she was doing her residency. Um, and so in this work that you've just talked about, um, I'm, I'm, what I'm understanding is that the, the blind community is, was for you um, sort of, they were consultants and research material, sort of how I understood that, how it informed this work. And, I, and thinking back to the work that you did in 2019, the community, um, the Quail to the Community Art Project for the blind community, I was just wondering how, where do you see your practice going next in terms of what do you see um, yourself as doing uh, community art projects or, or is it both? How do you see your practice going? 
Well, even from the beginning, I think um, the, the community art projects were um, a bit of, a, like I said, an experiment or like a research tool for me to inform my own work. Um, and in my time in New Glasgow, I didn't get a ton of time to work on um, my own personal projects um, for my art practice. So um, that didn't really come through then, but uh, I would like to keep working with um, the visually impaired community. Um, and there are some opportunities possibly coming up with Wonderneath combination when things are a little bit more opened up and uh, yeah, but um, it is always um, a goal to be um, working on my own work um, as a, as like, yeah, like, like a research or um, gathering information from the community who deals with it day to day. Like obviously um, I, I have 20-20 vision in one eye and uh, I, it does not affect me in my everyday life, but I think my experience in the past has given me the empathy and the um, knowledge of, to be able to relate to them in a way. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? It does, thanks, Sarah, yeah. Anyone else have uh, any questions for the emerging artists? Anyone out there? Well, in that case, I'll take this opportunity just to say that um, a big thanks to everyone for coming, but also a really big thanks to the people in this program. Uh, the emerging artists that you've heard speak today are, are talented and articulate, and they have also been really lovely to work with. It's been such a tough year for many people, particularly artists, and they have managed to um, not only be like uh, solid human beings, but uh, have really pushed their art uh, forward this year and, and worked on their practice. Um, and also a big thanks to their mentors for helping to guide them and helping to reach those goals in a time where many people have felt it is very difficult to even just um, exist in the world the way they used to, uh, for the mentors to be able to offer their time um, and share themselves is greatly appreciated. And uh, I am uh, hugely thankful to all the fine folks in this program. And I really encourage everyone to uh, follow their art further. Um, if there's no other questions, I'd love to take a minute and show you the video tour of the exhibition. Um, if anyone is interested in that, but I'll take another break too. Any other questions for the emerging artists? Okay, uh, yeah, if you don't mind, I'll share the video tour. We had um, a professional photographer, Vivka Schroeder, come in and document the exhibition and put together this tour, um, which is on YouTube right now, let me find it. And yeah, this is the exhibition that we're all in the gallery right now. Um, and you may or may not have been able to tell that from uh, this, but we're all distance, of course. Um, but the video tour will actually give you a much better sense of the work and allow you to see some of the work that is outside the gallery and um, by a couple of the mentors. And uh, Celine has a piece out there too. So I would love to show that to you now.
Oops, sorry. Uh, thank you all so much. I hope that uh, some of you can get to the exhibition at the Craig Gallery. A huge thanks to Lee Cripps of the Craig and uh, their staff for doing a great job. Um, the exhibition will be on until July 25th. And if anyone is interested in the mentorship program, uh, check out the Visual Arts Nova Scotia website. The deadline for applications for next year's program is the 15th. Um, but yeah, if anyone wants to learn more about these artists, uh, their information is all on the um, band's website as well, or check out their individual Instagram. Some of them are going to be doing some Instagram takeovers, I believe. Um, and yeah, thanks to everyone who could make it today. I really appreciate it. Come see something completely different.